So uh, I think uh, welcome everyone to this uh, special uh, webinar uh, organized by the uh, ISDE. Uh, I'm uh, Philip Chiu from uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm a surgeon uh, and uh, endoscopist, uh, so doing the uh, upper GI. And uh, we have a, a, a panel today, tonight, or tomorrow, this morning. So uh, um, uh, focusing on the, the discussion about the effect of uh, COVID-19 uh, on the, our clinical practice. So uh, first of all, uh, we'd like to uh, have an introduction of the uh, uh, position statement. In fact, the uh, ISDE have uh, quickly responded to the current uh, threat of the COVID-19 uh, to develop a position statement so that to help um, members and fellows uh, on how we should manage uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, in terms of uh, for the performance of surgery, uh, especially in the esophagus, and also for performance of uh, upper GI endoscopy. So may we now have uh, Dr. Hong Ji Yip from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, who will give us an overview of the position statement. Hong Ji. Thank you, Philip. So it's my honor uh, today to share with you about this uh, guidance, uh, which is uh, drafted early this month by the ISDE. So basically, the aim of the guidance is to provide healthcare professionals within the esophageal community uh, a, a general guidance on managing our patients during this COVID outbreak. outbreak. Um, the evidence related to uh, this pandemic actually is still emerging and evolving. So. Um, we are now trying to gather the information as much as we can uh, for this guidance, uh, but uh, of course uh, the, the things are changing so that the guidance could be reviewed and changed accordingly. And uh, we also acknowledge that there are differences among uh, the regions in terms of the severity of the outbreak, supply of medical resources such as PPE, surgical masks and respirators, occupancies of hospital general beds and ICU beds, so I believe the purpose of this webinar is actually to discuss the guidance notes with reference to all the experts that are here um, from different parts of the world. So the guidance notes actually consist of a total of 14 statements. So the first two are related um, to the general preparation of the hospitals and their uh, healthcare professionals in order to adapt to this uh, current COVID-19 outbreak. And the subsequent six uh, statements uh, would be related to endoscopic procedures, including how we can prioritize our procedures and our surface, how we screen patients according to the risk of COVID-19 infection, and the usage of protective gear during the endoscopy and in different endoscopic settings. So, um, and the subsequent four statements are more related to surgical parts. So we are um, also uh, talking about how we prioritize our surgical procedures and precautions to be taken in the preparation of upper GI related surgical procedures. And we have a final two statements uh, with special notes about uh, esophageal or upper GI cancers and how we suggest to reduce the risk uh, of our healthcare professional as well as our patients who are suffering from upper GI cancers of COVID infection while we try to maintain quality treatments for their cancers. So I think we'll start the ball rolling um, from uh, Kasari uh, about the endoscopic parts, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Honchi. So, uh, just re you. Oh, Sorry. you, you yeah. might need to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, um, this position statement was very useful, especially in the Western countries, because we we're not using uh, so much uh, the mask uh, or the physical distance uh, as much as you are doing uh, in, um, in more Asian country because we were already somewhat uh, uh, trained by the previous uh, uh, infection. So for us, it was really a, a change, a radical change. Here in Italy, we had uh, a terrible outbreak um, of the disease uh, and now we estimated uh, that at least uh, six 6% of the endoscopists uh, have been uh, uh, impacted uh, by the virus. So 6% uh, is the rate we have here in Italy for infected uh, endoscopists. In the same time, uh, we experience a dramatic shortage, uh, not only of respirators, but also of surgical masks. Our health system were completely 
unprepared and the physician who were frontline uh, started uh, to get infected or to die. We have more than 100 uh, physicians dying here in Italy from COVID-19. The third problem uh, was that the only possible reaction was to cut down, was to reduce substantially any endoscopy. So uh, what we did everywhere in, in, uh, in Europe uh, was to limit only to urgent and um, emergent endoscopy. For some time, uh, we had the possibility to have a triage that was based, uh, of course, on the symptoms, but also on epidemiology. So if you come from a high risk area, you are considered a high risk. If you come from low risk area, you are uh, low risk. But then everywhere in Europe, uh, we are a high risk area. So this triage uh, does not work anymore because virtually every patient should be considered as high risk patient. You should use the respirator, but we don't have enough respirator to do all the procedure. And then another problem that we face uh, is uh, upper endoscopy, because we feel that upper endoscopy is at higher risk of transmission uh, than lower endoscopy because of the aerosol. So uh, we needed to take some uh, precautions like uh, distancing the bed, not looking at the patient, taking care when entering, fully sedating the patient in order not to have uh, cough, uh, etc., and also to have a very limited uh, time uh, uh, procedure. But I feel that in the future, something that will help uh, would be some special device uh, to protect the physician doing upper endoscopy. So this was our initial reaction uh, to COVID-19. We, we come later with, uh, with the testing, etc. So back to, to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kesri. And uh, I think uh, this is a very uh, important information for us. Uh, and uh, also, uh, as uh, Hongji mentioned, there is a uh, variation in terms of the uh, instance of the uh, COVID-19 cases uh, around the world. And uh, we understand uh, from all the news that uh, Italy is heavily hit by the COVID-19 cases. And uh, we're really sorry about uh, the, your loss, uh, big loss of uh, the healthcare professionals and also your people. And uh, meanwhile, I think uh, it is uh, what we are we are also facing, even though without the risk of uh, of uh, maybe the risk is less because our instance is uh, lower in Hong Kong, but we are facing uh, the uh, uh, the uh, worry about uh, the transmission of the virus and also uh, the uh, protection. Uh, we don't have uh, enough the protect, uh, personal protection uh, equipment PPE, so. Uh, that is uh, always uh, uh, an issue. I think that is a uh, worldwide. So how can we, probably in the uh, following discussion, we have to think about how can we streamline uh, the use of the PPE? How can we conserve it? Or what kind of standards should we uh, be providing to the healthcare professional from both a surgical side and endoscopy side? So um, I think uh, with that, we can uh, continue our discussion and uh, so uh, I don't see uh, Professor uh, Rapishi. Uh, He's coming. He will come He's in a few minutes. Uh. So probably yes. we can have a look uh, from uh, from uh, endoscopy in uh, in uh, Asia. What what are you doing, or? Uh, okay. So uh, I think at this moment uh, we are also waiting for Professor Haruhiro Inoue, um, mm -hmm. who is the president of the JGES at, at this moment as well. So uh, maybe so we. From, from the discussion list, uh, we can see the next uh, speaker will have the honor from uh, actually Professor Chow, Ying Kai Chow, uh, who is a forensic surgeon, uh, who may share with us uh, some of the uh, uh, experience about um, the uh, management of esophageal cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic in uh, Taiwan. Is it okay, Professor Chow? Can you? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. so I'll start. Okay. Yeah, Maybe. we have the honor to have you to speak first. Okay. So uh, everyone can see my PowerPoint? Yes. 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 And yes. Yes. hear my voice? Yeah. Very good. Okay. <laughs> so uh, so it's, it's re uh, thanks for the invitation. And it's really my honor to join this, uh, this meeting. 
and I miss the, the lives of traveling everywhere. But now what we can do is sit here and just talk to each other from the internet. Yes, and so before I start my talk, I'll uh, share you with one of my favorite websites uh, telling us the information of coronavirus. And this website was called a uh, World Meter. And it is very, it has the updated data and it's like this. So it will show the every day the cases uh, occurred a uh, new cases in every country in the world and it used the uh, color to represent the trend of virus infection in every country and if it is the red line it means that it is still in trouble if it is blue it means that it's already uh, about to pass the plateau of infection and if it is green it means that oh this country is going to pass the disaster so which means that the Russia is still doing very badly. And the Spain is doing better now, and Germany is doing very well. And USA is still in the middle of the plateau. And also in a lot of countries like the South Korea is doing very well. And I'm sorry that Japan is still rising quickly. So it still takes some while to, uh, to settle down everything. And how about us? So it's like Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and Vietnam seems uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan is doing quite well. Uh, we are uh, so far, so we are have, we don't have a lot of cases so far, and we hope don't have more cases in the future as well. Yes, and I think that's the reason because Hong Kong and Taiwan, we, we were all severe injured during the SARS, that's 2003. And after that, we learned a lot about uh, uh, this very terrible virus, the coronavirus. So, and all the leaders at that time still have power now. So they know how to deal with this kind of virus infection during this pandemic time. So in Taiwan, we have around 395 cases so far. And it's not a lot. It's, I mean, compared with many different sides of the world, it's just a small number. And also most of the cases uh, from the imported is from many countries outside who coming back to Taiwan. And unlike the SARS period, only six were conference cases were from uh, the healthcare providers. So we are under very good protection so far by the government and by the hospital. So it's very good. Unlike the SARS during 2003, we had a lot of surgeons and doctors died during that period. But now so far it's not so bad. And also the severe, the mortality rate is 1%. And because we have a very good control so far, we have a very early border control. And we, our CDC, they start to uh, check the airplane from last year, December 31th, when they know that there are something in, Chi in Wuhan. And they try to check the airplane from last year, but not this year. And also they set up a border control very early. So, and because this is our vice president, who is a very famous epidemiologist and also the, our, our, the commander of the, the SARS, and he, now he become the vice president. So he set up a very good uh, rule and also the leadership. So that's so far, we are doing not so bad so far, like Hong Kong, yes. So in my hospital, we also have, we have a very big capacity in Taiwan, it's around 10,000 beds. So we are mo mostly the hospital in charge of almost maybe 80% of the uh, coronavirus infection in Taiwan. So we, we set up a very strong, uh, very uh, strong rule in regulation and also the triage of the patients. So we set up something like this. So in a hospital, we set up a lot of triage point. We limit the exit from, uh, from 20 to four. And every patient should have a lot of inspection before they enter the hospital. And also we have a lot of different triage and different uh, at entrance part. And also the isolation area, the red and the blue, but red, green, and yellow. So it's something like this. So, and we also set up a very clear uh, path for different color and different areas. Okay, and I'll skip this. And also for us, the surgeons, because surgeons are not the first line. 
on the second line. But our hospital asks us to separate into groups. So which means that, uh, for example, my patient and me can only appear in such floor in my hospital. I can't go to other floors because in case someone got infected, we have the second team can do something similarly. So we set up this team very early, it's around two months ago. We, we, we separate into different teams, but with same functions. So which means that once the 6A team disappeared, I mean, need to be uh, isolated and we have the 6B team can take over everything. Uh, and then for the 6C teams, uh, teams, and that's very important because when someone gets infected and the whole team will maybe need to isolate it quite on tight. So that's very important. And also the staff, we, we, have a, we have the app for every day to monitor our vitals. Uh, we have to keep it, uh, key in, uh, input our vitals every day and they will record it by the system every day in case that there are something uh, bad happen to the medical staffs. So we are under very uh, strict and good protection under my hospital. So that's, that's like the, the chart of uh, every employee in our hospital and have the blood temperature monitor every day. Okay, and how about surgery? So, uh, so I think talking about surgery, so as Hongji just reported, the ISDE guideline for how to management of other upper GI endoscopy and surgery during the COVID-19 outbreak. So, and because I'm a thoracic surgeon, so we do both thoracic, I mean lung and esophagus, and I belong to both ISDE and also the ATS or the uh, AATS is from the American. So just several days ago, the ATS, they also published their guideline of how to manage the patients during the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic era. And so in the following slides, I will show you the ATS guideline because I know that Hongji and Philip will show everybody about ISD guideline. And actually they are very similar, very, very similar. So because I've read both of them, and I'll show you some important points. And then maybe we can have some discussion later as well. So first, they divide it into three phases. So first, as a surgeon, you should uh, know what's the position of your hospital and the status of the COVID-19 in your country. So if your hospital has only few COVID-19 patients and the hospital resource is intact, which means that you still have plenty of ICU bed ventilators, clinicians, and then, uh, so you can, surgery is not so restrictive. That is the situation in my, in my hospital now. So for esophageal cancer, you can do esophagectomy in, uh, in patients with esophageal cancer, and that is, you can do still as soon as possible. And for those who, but for those who might be stay for a long ICU, ICU stay after surgery, for the high risk patients, maybe you should wait for three months and then to do the surgery because that patient might occupy the ICU for a long time. And for the ESD, for ATS guidelines, they say maybe you should think about alternative treatment. And that I think we can discuss later. How about the, how to put the patient for ESD should we wait or we can do as like in this column as soon as possible for the T1A and some T1B superficial patients. So in the second phase, maybe there are a lot of hospitals in Europe, I think is, is now in this phase. So it's the, they have many COVID-19 patients and the resources is very limited. You have only small ICU bed and also ventilators. So for this, the surgery only reserved for one condition, that is the perforation of the cancer. So otherwise, everything should uh, underwent, undergo alternative treatment. And also there is something very interesting. So it's like this, it's the new adjuvant versus definitive chemoradiotherapy. Radio and so uh, in this, if you are in this phase, maybe you should consider for those you used to treat by new adjuvant therapy, you can shift to definitive chemoradiotherapy and followed by uh, step surgery if the patient have uh, evidence of persistent disease or recurrent disease. 
Uh, and because I think this virus pandemic time might be finished within the next three to six months. So maybe it's a good way to postpone some surgery patients, but also maintain a very good survival. And so, and this is another concept that is also very, uh, very, I mean, being discussed is very prevalent now. So because in the past, new adjuvant surgery, uh, new adjuvant CRT always followed by surgery. So there are some patients, they find that maybe surgery is not always needed. Uh, I mean, the scheduled surgery. So there are some trials that is going on in Europe that called the Sano trial. So surgeries as needed for the always virtual cancer. So they find that for patients who have good response, so which means that uh, there is no residual cancer by uh, biopsy, PETs, and the CT. And perhaps you can let the patient uh, uh, withhold the surgery and, and followed by endoscope for every three months. And until you find evidence of residual cancer, and then you do the surgery. And that, from their preliminary result, it is very promising. And they can uh, save around 80% of the esophagus, don't need the surgery, and survive. So in this, maybe, uh, this concept is still under uh, investigation, but I think it's another way. Uh, if, you, if you are in phase two and you're facing this kind of patient, then you can postpone the surgery in this subgroup of patients. And in phase three, that is uh, only the preparation of cancer is the only surgical part. And other parts, there is no, no indication for surgery, okay? And finally, this is another very important part, that is the CO2. So when the, during the surgery, when you need to put in the CO2, I mean the CO2 pneumothorax or pneumoperitoneum, like for the esophagectomy, you need both. You need, you, you need pneumoperitoneum in, and you need artificial pneumothorax. And there are a lot of things you need to keep in mind. Even the patient has maybe low risk of COVID-19, maybe, but you don't know, but you should put protect yourself and also, I mean, your staffs and also all the OR, OR staffs and nurses. So first, there are some tricks that are uh, pointed out by some papers and some researchers. So first, we should make the port incision as small as possible. And all this was to try to let not the CO2 out. And then you should use the lowest pleasure as as low as possible, but to keep a good uh, uh, acceptable field. And then you should let uh, your partner, I mean the anesthesia doctors, to maintain a very good deep neuromuscular block. Otherwise, when you do the surgery and the patient is, uh, I mean, they are try to uh, use the abdominal for breathing and they will let the CO2 out very quickly. And also you should minimize the leakage of CO2 through the trochas. And also, when you are using an ultrasonic device, please try to set the energy to the lowest level uh, to minimize the smoke. And also, you can use some closed smoke evacuation device like the LCO system and other filter systems and try to make it like the closed circulation system. And also, when you finish the surgery, don't let the CO2 rapid separation very quickly you should uh, slowly and don't let it out. And because that will uh, put yourself and also your uh, uh, colleagues in danger. So and that's all my part of the surgery part. And thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Yin Kai. Uh, very informative and important uh, information. And uh, I, I share with you, uh, that uh, you know, uh, in during the very early epidemics uh, uh, of the uh, COVID-19, in fact, uh, we did uh, one the thoracic surgery. Uh, worry, worry about um, whether the patient is having uh, any uh, positive uh, virus. And at that time, the uh, COVID test is not uh, commonly available. So uh, what we did is uh, we all wear um, uh, N95 mask and uh, performing the thoracic part for four and a half hour and it's really, really challenging. So uh, my question to, about is that uh, whether you actually would uh, recommend um, 
that we shouldn't use any CO2 at all because you mentioned a very important point. And there are some uh, surgeons who actually say that uh, we shouldn't do any laparoscopic surgery because of the risk of uh, this uh, gas leak. So during the insufflation, maybe we should all change it to open. What would be your opinion? Uh, actually, I've read some guidelines from the gynecologist and also the, the general surgeons. So from all these guidelines, I think uh, they all they all recommend laparotomy, but not, not laparoscopy. And I think that's that's reasonable. I think we should we should uh, minimize the use of CO two in if the patient has highly suspicious or even suspicious of the the infection. And also one thing for the chest. Uh, so how do you manage the chest tube after surgery? Do you still put the closed drain or open drain? or do you underwater seal? And how do you minimize, because if you, so what's your policy for putting a chest tube in that patient? Do you use a closed drain or open drain or doing, putting some filter in your drain system? So Philip, what's, what did you do for that patient? Yeah, I think uh, we, we generally just uh, put in uh, like a closed system, uh, no suction. But well, that is our usual practice uh, for his objectivity. But I, I know that some forensic surgeons always uh, do a suction, positive suction. Yeah. So I guess there may also be some risk if uh, the patient turned up with a COVID uh, positive uh, patient. Theoretically, you know, if a positive suction in the circuit, you may actually spread the virus. Yes, and, and so and the, if the patient has some poor adhesion during the surgery and you need to do some pruralysis, and that will also keep <laughs> let us uh, in danger, right? <laughs> so we have to yes. be very careful. Yes. yes, because as a vasectomy is the field that you should, you have both the neck and the chest and the abdomen. And we should be very careful and also high risk and a high longer ICU stay. So that will occupy the hospital resource. So we should be very yes. considered to do surgery in very, uh, I mean, moderate or low risk patients, but not for high risk patients at this moment. That's my suggestion. Thank you very much. So I think uh, we should then uh, move on and uh, I would hand back to Chesri, uh, Professor yeah. Hassan, and uh, you can, you know, uh, yeah. take the lead and follow. Yeah, thanks, uh, Philip. We, we are joined by two exceptional uh, guests, uh, Professor Repici from the red, very red area in Milan and Professor Inoue, probably from a uh, bit less uh, uh, infected area. So. Uh, Alessandro, what is uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your feeling about COVID after so, so much time and after so, so much research uh, on the topic? What is your recommendation uh, to the panel? So thanks, uh, Jason. Um, uh, thanks to everybody for joining this webinar. I see several familiar faces. Thank you so much for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity. So. So if you're just asking me, sorry for being like this because I'm in between procedures and uh, I have to go back to perform the last ELCP of the day. So in, yeah, if you ask me what is the feeling is that uh, I'm very scared. So the real feeling now is a physician, I'm very scared. There are so many people still uh, come in the hospital with infection and um, the other feeling is a very big level of uncertainty. We do not know exactly what is going on. So to give you a picture of the situation, since yesterday, so the hospital board has decided that everybody who is going to be admitted in the hospital for non-COVID disease, so patients undergoing uh, uh, stenting for uh, esophageal cancer, severe dysphagia, or patients undergoing uh, surgery for pancreatic cancer, whatever, they need to be tested for uh, uh, swab and with CT scan. So yesterday we started this, and today we discovered that 50% of the patients are positive. They said they are totally asymptomatic. So now we are getting crazy, so we don't know what to do. So the level of uncertainty is so high and everything is being written is going to change the day after day. So we write a statement today, which may not be completely true or totally true in one week or two weeks. So my, my feeling, I, I don't know the direction. I'm not able to understand what will be the projection of this disease. And probably 
we also have to admit uh, and should be very humble to say that this virus is so new to us and there are so many unknown things that uh, we, we need to learn before we take a sort of final direction. And uh, we, we, were, we were quite optimistic yesterday saying that probably in two to three weeks we are going to open a little bit the hospital and the endoscopy to, 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 to regular patients. And today we changed the direction we, because we discovered that the amount of people who are asymptomatic carriers is so high that we cannot get control of it. Ale, Alessandro, I feel that what you said is extremely important because it seems that Europe is going to follow the Chinese recommendation to do a LAN CT to any person who is admitted to the hospital. So what you say is incredible. It means that eventually Europe follow China. But now, now listen to Professor Inoue what the Japanese society recommend for uh, protection from uh, COVID-19. Hello, yes, yes. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very important conference. And uh, now in Japan, the uh, 9.30 p.m. So mm. I'm in my room. <laughs> And it's a very nice, very nice. I can, I can hear very well. So um, current situation in Japan, is the um, number of uh, uh, corona patients uh, increases gradually, not rapidly, but gradually increases. So um, last few days, uh, the situation getting worse in Japan. So. Um, our uh, surgical point of view, our uh, surgical society, Japanese surgical society group um, uh, uh, made a proposal, uh, only, only emergency surgery. We have to wait the elective surgery cases and the, uh, we just perform surgery only for emergency cases. It's the same thing uh, to uh, endoscopy society. Um, we have the uh, now the uh, strategy. Uh, we wait the elective patient um, at least one month. We think so. If the situation getting better, we gradually, gradually start started to do start. We'll start the uh, regular endoscopic examination. But at this moment, we just perform the uh, emergency cases. Can I Thank comment? You. Yeah, uh, I I was really interested in uh, phase phase one two three classification. I think this is very important. Usually, guidelines just recommend this uh, classification and then how to protect uh, from infection or something. But uh, I think it's really depend on the risk of community prevalence of community. For for example, like uh, Milan. Uh, you say that 50% uh, of positive rate. So it's really, we have to avoid every elective procedure. We really try to avoid elective procedure, but uh, still we are performing bit ordinary procedure. So it really depends on the, you know, risk of community or prevalence of that. I think most guidelines does not uh, include such things. Probably Philips uh, APSD guideline uh, included such concept, but the most of the guidelines just recommend how to protect or strongly protect or something. I think it's very important to adapt all guidelines community. Yeah, I, I think so. Yes. Yeah, I, I also want to comment on this because uh, also here in Italy, we have uh, a completely different prevalence uh, of diseases. Uh, there are some regions where Alessandro is, uh, where you have uh, uh, even uh, 1000 cases every day. And then you come to my region and we have only 20. So there is a 50 fold difference across regions. And this, uh, I fully agree with Noria, should be reflected uh, in, the, in, the, in the clinical practice. I mean, uh, if the risk is very low, you can probably do uh, all the 
case by case procedure like fit positive uh, or uh, uh, this failure, etc. If not only urgency, the problem is where to put the cut off uh, because the World Health Organization uh, don't provide any stratification uh, of the community prevalence of COVID-19 across different areas. So I fully agree that this is one of the priority that would affect uh, our uh, behavior in the next uh, in the next uh, future. And uh, I, I, I want I, I'm curious to know if any of you is using, as Alessandro was suggesting, uh, the use of uh, PCR testing uh, for patients for COVID-19 uh, before surgery, for instance. Not, not really. <laughs> I, I think uh, for us, uh, we because our uh, is not very high, so at this moment we are practicing the so-called uh, FTOCC uh, screening. So whether it's pre fever, truffle history, occupation, contact, and uh, uh, the risk and assess. And uh, if there's a high risk, uh, definitely we check uh, COVID. But I think uh, what uh, you have in Italy is a totally different ballgame, as uh, Ali mentioned that uh, even asymptomatic uh, patient, uh, they have a high risk of having the virus. So I think this is uh, totally different. So uh, I think, uh, uh, Ali, uh, you published uh, also a guideline about the use of the PPE for during the endoscopy. Maybe you and uh, Haru can comment uh, what is the appropriate use of the PPE during the upper endoscopy. Uh, thanks, Felix. So I, I... Um, so we, 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 we did extensive uh, research with um, about 40 endoscopy in the area of uh, the most epicentric uh, um, infect part of infection in Italy altogether with Cesare. So we have uh, very good data that we can share with all of you. So the first data is this. We collected data on uh, 1,000 patients uh, who have been scoped in the months of March in my unit. And um, we followed up all of them and we made um, a, a questionnaire. We, we called all of them, we made a questionnaire, we asked about uh, uh, respiratory symptoms, fever, and uh, eventually the use of the test. So only eight patients out of 1,000, they got some kind of respiratory symptoms. Five of them were tested. The three of them were considered very mildly symptomatic, so they they were not they were not sent for the test. They were not referred for the test. And only one out of eight out of one thousand patients was tested positive. And that patient was one patient who turned out to be positive sixteen days after colonoscopy. So I'm not sure that. The, the infection was taken into the endoscopy. So the first data I want to share with you that we analyzed with Cesare, we are going to publish in GAT, it's been accepted yesterday, is that when you do endoscopy, if you follow the rule, and you are protecting yourself, you are protecting your patients using properly the PPE, the risk for patients of getting the infection is very minimal, very, very minimal. The other point is that we have evaluated with Cesare is that we reported the data on infection among healthcare personnel working in the endoscopy workspace, okay? Not just the, all, all of the uh, workers in the, in the GI department, but specifically those living and working uh, for more than eight hours per day in endoscopy workplace. So the rate of infection is uh, about 4%. So we interviewed about 1,000 endoscopy personnel in uh, more than 45 hospitals. And uh, the, if you look to this data, uh, these are almost uh, half the rate of the infection in uh, uh, hospital workers in Italy. So in Italy, uh, all professionals involved in the hospital who are COVID positive, like our hospital, we are a quarter for COVID positive patients, is about eight to nine percent. So in endoscopy, the amount of people who have been reported with the infection is 4.3. So again, if you properly use the PPE, the risk of getting infected, if you are 
healthcare professional in endoscopy is again not the high. And the other point that we got from our research, and this is another paper that we would like to generate within today, is that we classify the hospital based on the policy with PP. And we have a sort of uh, retrospective randomization because one third of the hospital were using only this surgical mask and wearing now plus partial shield. And they were not using the N95 respirators. Those hospitals, which is about one third of our cohort, were using the N95 only specifically for those patients who were uh, known COVID positive, so very few patients. And the rest of the hospital, two thirds, they were using uh, N95 all the time for all patients. So they were, uh, they had a lot of uh, masks, they were free to use the N95, which is quite a unique situation, no? because you know there is big shortage of this. And when we compared the numbers, so the number of infected people among healthcare personnel did not differ between the two groups. And we are talking about more than 1,500 people who were um, analyzed in this uh, big cohort. So what does it mean? It's not the, only the mask itself. It's the multiple protections and also the way you use all that stringent measures that are going to protect you. I don't think there is only the mask. It's the mask, the facial shield, the double gloves, the water-resistant gown, the fact that you, you follow very strict the rule of cleaning your hands. So if you do all of this issue properly, probably the risk is the same or whatever you're wearing, N95 or surgical mask. Yes. Yes. Yes, um, so it's a very important point. So PPE, it's a very, very important for us. And the, uh, uh, of course, the uh, full caution, full caution is uh, necessary. Um, we have to protect, but uh, the problem is a, a shortage of uh, resources. That's a problem. So uh, we have to um, control the in between. So, of course, guideline and the recommendation is a full caution of the PPE is a very important, but the, uh, actually when we uh, perform the endoscopy, um, um, yeah, so at the time, so not always um, uh, PPE, not enough. So that's a problem. If we, can, if we change, so everything in each case, uh, uh, we have a shortage of the uh, PPE. So how is the situation in uh, Hong Kong? Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I think I fully agree. So uh, we established our guidelines. So uh, in, uh, inside our endoscopy center. So uh, uh, for a uh, session, we have a limited uh, number of uh, endoscopists and nurses. So just uh, the uh, most experienced endoscopists, uh, one and also two nurses will be doing the whole session. They would uh, probably be, we, we adopt the policy of a uh, conservative use of the PPE. So if there is uh, any need or contamination of the gown, we will change it. But uh, for the mask, uh, we recommend just to wear one mask for the whole session because um, as Ali mentioned, it's not only about the PPE, but the whole infection control process, which is important. So every time if we change, we also expose ourselves to a risk of transmission of the uh, virus because uh, we don't know whether our gang or our mask is being contaminated. So we need to follow a strict uh, a rule of uh, changing the PPE as well. So that is also what we learned from the SARS period. Also, probably it is included in a statement, but uh, it is very important to, you know, training or, you know, instruction how to you know uh, wearing a mask or every PPE and not only endoscopy but also nurses and also every staff uh, who, who is cleaning the endoscopy room or everyone they have to be tr well trained I think that is very important or more emphasized so uh, Noria I think uh, you have prepared something do you want to uh, make uh, some presentation for us uh, no, no, I, I just, just a sum, summary, so I think it's okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to add 
a two points to, to the discussion. So first, uh, N95, there was a very nice meta-analysis uh, in the pre-COVID area showing uh, no superiority of N95 over surgical mask uh, for virus infection. And the main reason uh, attributed by the authors uh, was that uh, not all uh, healthcare personnel uh, know how to wear properly the N95. So I agree with Nuria that uh, the training uh, in the uh, use of PPE is extremely important. Why? Because self-perception of the healthcare personnel in how to use PPE is completely misleading. People who feel to be extremely good in how to wear PPE are actually very bad. For this reason, it's always good that two person cooperate in downing and doffing in order to correct possible mistake that may, that may happen. Then, I mean, I have a last curiosity. Is there any innovation, any technological innovation in the field of endoscopy or surgery that can help uh, the healthcare personnel to reduce the risk of infection? For instance, can we somewhat block the aerosol from the endoscope uh, or in a laparoscopy or our single-use endoscope? Uh, Cesare, maybe now Cesare, for, uh, Cesare, probably if we use the robot that's been developed by Philip, we have a long distance from the patients. And this, this is what I thought was the solution, the final solution. I think this is very timely. So, Philip, congratulations. If you can provide a couple of robots also to Milano, we will be happy to test your robot because there is a significant distance from the patients. We will, we will leave the robot in, in contact with the virus. And I don't think it's going to be affected by the virus. So, Philip, is yeah. your robot ready? Is your robot ready? Well, we. Actually, because of the COVID-19, we are waiting for the shipment of the robot from Singapore to Hong Kong. We are still waiting. So there's uh, some Not delay. Big, but, that, right? You know that uh, people are actually talking about using the robot to take uh, deep uh, nasal swab so that mm -hmm. to avoid, uh, you know, aerosol generation and uh, the risk of the, for the healthcare professional. So I think robot robotics is one of them. But I also see some very simple uh, technique or methodology and uh, recently there's uh, one publication in the New England Journal of Medicine from the anesthesia using just a transparent plastic uh, hood to cover the patient before they intubate. So maybe in doing the upper endoscopy we may adopt a similar transparent hood so to cover all the patient and then we can just uh, perform the endoscopy. But I guess uh, the other way that uh, now, now in the past uh, we don't do sedation that much but because of the COVID-19 for upper endoscopy, we adopt more sedation, so to uh, uh, patient become more relaxed and the less gag reflex and less coughing. Yeah, you're right. I would like to add about the laparoscopic part as uh, Ketri has mentioned. So I think there are actually commercially available filters already um, from made by different companies that are trying to reduce the smoke that uh, has been evacuated, especially when you're, you're insufflating CO2. And um, so there actually has been a multiple arguments whether laparoscopic it, procedures should be done um, in this COVID outbreak. So on one side, you may consider that uh, doing laparoscopy might have a smoke generation or viral generation that uh, may have a hazard to our uh, healthcare professional. But on the other hand, um, if you do a good laparoscopic surgery, you expect a better recovery of your patients who may end up uh, less or shorten his or her hospital stays and also less complication. And this is also another side of the story, which may, we, want, we may need to consider as well, because um, our hospital capacity to accommodate different uh, COVID patients are also one of the main concern when we are dealing with uh, especially elective patients, because uh, we're limiting our elective procedures nowadays. Um. Philip, now we are limiting our procedure, but one day we need to restart. So hopefully in, in Italy, it will be in one month. So maybe in Hong Kong, in, the, in Japan, it will be in uh, less or more time. So how to replan all of this burden of elective procedures, surgical and endoscopy that we now 
suspended. So how to restart? Uh, I'm curious to know what all the panel feel about it. How to restart uh, in what we do? So, thanks, uh, Cheshire. I, I, uh, you know, I, I would like to comment because, uh, as uh, mentioned, we recently uh, published the APSDE guideline on the uh, COVID-19 for endoscopy. So uh, in the guideline, we also mentioned uh, to uh, describe one statement. It's about uh, how to restart. So I think uh, from the perspective, uh, both from surgery and endoscopy, we are thinking that uh, we have the few factors that we have to consider. First is the, the uh, instance of the COVID-19 uh, cases. I think uh, it's uh, rightly pointed out by uh, Ying Kai. So if uh, there's a trend of increasing, I think uh, everybody will be only doing uh, emergency endoscopy uh, or emergency surgery. So, but then if you can see a downward trend and uh, maybe uh, you have um, probably are not looking into an app, no, no case, uh, you know, because uh, now we, we will have an asymptomatic case patient anyway, but uh, we can see a downtrend in the case. Uh, and, the, and the second thing is uh, the availability of the PPE, uh, that uh, there's uh, also always a stress uh, to the hospital, uh, and also the availability of the manpower, because uh, I know in some of the uh, uh, hospital, they are deploying uh, 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 doctors uh, from different specialty to help in managing the COVID case or to support the uh, medical team in managing other cases so that uh, the infection team, the physician can focus on the management of the COVID-19. So in that perspective, you need the availability of the manpower and also the PPE. So uh, that would be also an important factor. Ale, how will you restart in doing the, the elective procedure? How will you hierarchize the priority? That's crazy, guys. So we don't really know. So we, we, we started talking about that since a couple of days. Once the curve started going down, flattening a little bit and now going down. So there's a lot of discussion. The main problem is still part of uncertainty Then is based on two issues. First, nobody knows what is the value of the rabbit test, the blood rabbit test. There is a lot of uh, studies ongoing upcoming, but we do not have data that can tell you that that test is really sensitive and specific. So we don't know exactly which tests are the best to give the sort of uh, um, permission to go to the hospital. And the other one is capability, because uh, even though we have decided that we do the swap test to everybody who want to get in into the hospital, we did an estimation. In the pre-COVID era, we had about, uh, including outpatients and inpatients, about 6,000 patients coming into the hospital for any kind of activities, uh, CT scan, MRI, radiology, whatever, uh, ophthalmology, everything. So even though we decrease by 50 or 40, 60%, we go to 2,000 or 3,000 person per day, we do not have the capability of testing 3,000 in few hours, plus there is no test available. So now most of the country, they have centralized the purchase of the test. So they deliver to the single hospital, but they don't keep the amount of tests that will be required to get the patients into the hospital. So just crazy discussion. Nobody knows a lot of scientists going in TV and giving recommendations based on shit. Everything is crap because they say things that are not practically doable. Because they say, okay, test everybody, but how you can get tested? Impressive. Nobody knows. Yeah. So we, we, we are not allowed to test because we don't have the test. Yeah. And Haru, did the Japanese society uh, provide any criteria on how to restart uh, after the end of the outbreak? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very good question and uh, we have to discuss this. Uh, um, be, but still in Japan, the number is increasing. So uh, we are discussing how to reduce uh, the uh, uh, examination. You understand? So yeah. reduce the number of surgery, elective surgery, elective endoscopy. We have uh, controlled the number of cases. That, that current situation is uh, uh, right now. So uh, we, ha we have to follow your, you are a little bit advanced. <laughs> so um, I, I get some information from you. 
and the uh, but the personally personally i think uh, um it's uh, it's a uh, officially very difficult to uh, when decide when we start the elective cases. Um, uh, at this moment, uh, we are uh, recommended, recommended uh, to uh, reduce the number of cases uh, for elective patient, uh, generally stop it, and then uh, restart the uh, point is of course the number of uh, new patient decreases and the uh, um, after that, so we have a full discussion with the patient, the necessity of the endoscopy, necessity of the surgery, and the uh, risk of a surgery, risk of infection. So um, we have to discuss with the patient carefully. Philip, I feel that uh, we have one last point. Uh, um, do you feel that there will be an increase uh, in mortality by upper GI cancer for the delay of diagnosis, uh, for the delay of uh, chemoradiotherapy, for the delay of surgery. And I'm also interested uh, in what all of you from surgeon perspective feel about this. So I, I think uh, I would direct this question to uh, both uh, Professor Noria Ueto and Professor Yen Kai Chao. I think yeah. uh, maybe Noria can come in from the endoscopist perspective and uh, Yen Kai uh, come in from the surgeon's perspective. So first of all, probably uh, maybe you know, but uh, our epidemiologist in our hospital uh, published the data of natural history of early gastric cancer. So median time to develop early gastric cancer to advance uh, takes 44 months, mean three or four years. So I think for early stage cancer, I think almost like a semi-urgent or almost like a elective treatment. So I think early stage cancer, I think we can wait until uh, COVID infection status is settled down. This is my opinion. Yes, so I think, I mean, compare with gastric cancer, esophageal cancer is um, relatively rapid growing cancer. So, uh, but according to some studies, so for those who receive chemo radiotherapy, Already, I mean, uh, the waiting period between the surgery, uh, the, uh, the chemotherapy and surgery, in the past, they always put six to, six to eight weeks. But now there are more and more papers that are telling us that if you wait for more than 12 weeks or four, 16 weeks, there is no difference in patient outcome. So I think for new adjuvant treated cases, maybe, uh, the postpone of surgery for two or three months, maybe the outcome is not different. And sometimes they find the rate of, I mean, pathological combo response is higher when you wait longer. So maybe there's not so bad for new adjuvant cases, but for savage cases, maybe there will be some uh, difference. If you detect the recurrence too late, maybe I mean, the surgical curability will be, uh, be lower because you might, might not have a good, uh, yet, uh, I mean, the circumferential resection margin because of the delay of the diagnosis. And for the ESD, I'm not really sure. Maybe, Philip, you can tell us. So I think maybe for T1A to T1B, maybe there will be more cases that used to suitable for T ESD, maybe become the surgeons can be the uh, surgeon's uh, patient, maybe. I'm not sure, but you can, but you do both. So maybe it's all your patients. <laughs> so maybe you can tell me what's your idea about the early cancers. Yeah, I think uh, both uh, Professor Inoue and uh, I did uh, esophageal and also uh, esophageal ESD. So uh, uh, for me, uh, we, we have been uh, also providing limited service, but uh, because our number is uh, not uh, very big, so our hospital uh, resource is not overwhelmed yet, uh, luckily. So we have uh, reduced um, our service and uh, at one point uh, up to only emergency endoscopy. But right now we are doing 50% of uh, the normal capacity of endoscopy because uh, to the, these few days, uh, number of COVID cases single digit. So four free cases per day. 
So, uh, and then the, for the uh, ESD, we have been actually doing ESD also. Uh, but uh, of course, I think uh, uh, for esophageal, squamous esophageal cancer, I think uh, the turn around time may be uh, quicker. So um, we try to do uh, esophageal ESD uh, also at our endoscopy unit. So how about uh, Professor Inoue, what's your comment? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, uh, regarding surgery, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Lin Kai Chao. His comment is correct, I think. So um, most of the patient receives a new adjuvant chemotherapy. And then, so we can wait three months. We can wait three months after chemotherapy, new adjuvant chemotherapy, we can wait. And then uh, during such a three months period, the, uh, this situation improved, I, I improved, I believe. And then uh, after that, we can perform surgery more safely to the patient. And the, uh, regarding ESD, um, at this moment, we think T1A or T1B are the close to T1A. So such kind of patient, uh, I, I think it's better to wait one month, two months, three months. Of course, the patient are asymptomatic so uh, I think it's better to wait but of course the yeah, gastric cancer so poorly differentiated it's another significant cell carcinoma it's another story but so regular squamous cell cancer patient and the ballots uh, ESD have to wait okay uh, thank you very much. I think uh, we're almost up to the time for one hour of, uh, I think this is a very beneficial uh, meeting uh, for all of us. And uh, I think, uh, thank you very much to all our panelists, uh, uh, Professor Haruhio Inoue from uh, Japan, uh, and uh, President of the JGS, and also uh, Professor Noria Uedo from uh, Osaka, and uh, Professor Yinkai Chao from uh, Taiwan, and uh, Dr. Hongji Yip from Hong Kong, and uh, also uh, Chesri, uh, Professor Chesri Hassan, who is uh, one of the leader in the drafting of the ISDE uh, guideline uh, statement about uh, the COVID-19. And also uh, uh, Professor uh, Ali uh, Alexandra Rapisi. And I think he is uh, really uh, both Chesri and uh, Ali uh, in the center of fighting against uh, the uh, COVID-19. So uh, I think uh, this is a very useful tip uh, for everyone. And I hope that uh, we can benefit uh, to uh, worldwide uh, upper endoscopist and also uh, for gut uh, surgeon in the performing uh, esophageal uh, surgery and also uh, upper endoscopy. So with that, uh, thank you very much for all, all of your uh, efforts and jo in joining this uh, wonderful uh, webinar meeting on the COVID-19 uh, with ISDE. Thank you very much. Thanks.